<clears throat> well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for this uh, second program. Thank you for being here for the second program in the Boxo 10 by 10 series. Uh, there are a couple of more uh, weekends coming up with uh, some programming, so look for announcements about that. But in the meantime, you know, we're here to welcome Eli Hurtle. Uh, Eli did his residency back in 2019. We have, a, we have a debate, an ongoing debate about this. Uh, but I, I'll look it up. And Eli was here in 2019 um, and uh, did an initial residency and then really pleased to have him back with this installation um, on the land. Before we get going with the presentation itself, um, I just wanted to acknowledge that we're on the unceded territory of the Kauia, the Chimawebe, and the Serrano people. And I also want to uh, acknowledge the support of the California Arts Council for programming that's going on this year and to other donors who are here present. Thank you. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Eli, who's uh, had a real journey getting down here, flight cancellations, flight delays, he's come down from Victoria, British Columbia, and uh, really happy you could be here again and, <coughs> and to talk about your magnificent project. Thanks so much, Brad. I'll try and use a loud voice today. <laughs> my, my friends tease me that I, I seem to whisper a lot of the time, so I'll, I'll do my best to project. Um, it does feel really, really amazing to come back um, to be here again. Um, it feels full circle. Um, I've been able to focus a lot on this project over the last year. I received some funding from the Canada Council for the Arts. Um, to, to dedicate a lot of this year to work on this project. Um, but I always go back to the two weeks that I had over there and being able to look up at the sky from here as being a, a really big inspiration for how this project has unfolded. Um, before we begin, I want to uh, want to introduce myself in Nehiyuewen. Tante Nitutamatak Eli Hurdold Ni Suikosan. I just said, uh, welcome friends and family. My name is Eli Hurdle. Uh, and that's in Nehiyuewen, uh, the Cree language, which um, my language learning journey has been a, a, a big part of this project. It was another kind of early seed that, that grew into this. Um, back in Victoria, where Bernard mentioned I live, where I was born and raised, um, I work as a curator at a gallery, but uh, I, I also primarily um, work as a filmmaker. And a film project I've been able to work on for the past six years is called Voices on the Rise. And it's about Indigenous language revitalization in Canada. Um, in the course of that, um, filming that project, there was... Um, there was a time when I was in Edmonton with uh, Nae Uwewen and Cree syllabics teacher Ruben Quinn where I was asking him about our written system, the syllabic system, which I have some tattoos on my hands that represent that. Um, Ruben told me something which I think was the earliest spark for this project. He, he told me that the syllabics um, come from the stars, and that chart is called the star chart. Um, and we also refer to ourselves as, as Nehewak, as the Cree people, as star people. And so there are all these instances where um, stars and star knowledge and star stories have come up over the years as I've been reconnecting with culture and family and identity in different ways. Um, but it was really the two weeks that I was here with Bernard and Jake um, <laughs> where I was able to spend um, two weeks really focusing on this and thinking about it in, um, in a my myriad of ways. Um, different ways to approach learning this, learning this knowledge, learning these stories. Um, COVID put that on hold. Um, I didn't work on it for a couple of years, but then Last fall, um, after some, some, some digging as to what was really important to me, what was something that I really wanted to spend the, the next year working on, um, this, this came back to the forefront for me. Um, 
guess I'll mention the the, the title of the work, Fatamuen uh, Ochi Pakwan Gishek, uh, A Dream from the Hole in the Sky. Um, so that references this constellation, Pakwan Gishek, The Hole in the Sky, or the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters. Um, some people say it's this the oldest story in the world, that the time when we were able to see all seven of the stars that are referenced in that um, was tens of thousands of years ago. Um, it's not that one of those stars disappeared, two of them got so close to each other that now they look like they are one. Um, so it was the first thing that I saw in the sky when I arrived late last night. I looked up, Bernard, Bernard and I had a little bit of a, a talk about where we were thinking it would go and um, when it's up in the night sky tonight in that direction um, there's a reason that I placed it this way in this direction and also with this uh, the remnants of the previous installation that was here um, I could have I could have put it over there but what was really speaking to me when I brought the work out this morning um, was this patch right here in a circle really being quite perfect to represent the whole of the sky and what that means to us as as uh, as Nahewa. Um, before I tell the story, I wonder if there's anything else that I that I want to mention. Do you want to talk about why you use ramming? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good idea. Um, when I was here in 2019, um, I met Heidi from the Yucca Valley Materials Lab and we talked about possibly doing a residency there, or that I would come back up and do a residency there. And that was something that I had tied into the, um, the grant that I wrote last fall. Um, I was scheduled to spend um, all of October here making these in glass. And in conversation with Heidi over the spring, it didn't seem like we were going to be able to make them to the scale that I was hoping we could in glass. Um, so I talked to a friend of mine who's a ceramicist in Victoria, um, and she was willing to help me make these and assured me that we could find a glaze that um, would not only feel like the night sky for me, which was an important part of what I wanted to do with the glass, but would be the size that I wanted and the shape that I wanted. Um, so we spent the last two months hand building um, 18 of these. So there's these six that I brought with me. Um, oh, that was, that was the other thing I wanted to mention, that I recently opened up two exhibitions in Victoria for this project as well. This is not the only iteration of this. This is one one component that I was able to travel with while the other two exhibitions are up right now. Um, and so the exhibition that I opened this past Wednesday at one gallery was focusing solely on this constellation, which for us is a big part of our creation story. Um, and, <laughs> and the other exhibition um, focused on four other constellations uh, that I've learned about over the course of the summer. Um, and so for this for this project, not only was I thinking about materials that I was going to explore and how I was going to represent them, like with these ceramic beads, um, the biggest part of it for me was relationship building and spending time in Alberta um, with Cree elders and knowledge keepers and asking questions and hearing stories. So um, I went on three separate trips back home to Alberta um, and that took up a lot of my year. That took up a lot of time just kind of building the foundation and the framework. 
and it was only in October and November that I was in my studio kind of thinking through how was I going to represent that and I had some good I had some ideas beforehand of what I wanted to make um, and what I came up with were some pretty large um, what I'm calling star maps they're black pieces of suede and when I was first here in 2019 they were kind of I was experimenting with a kind of a smaller piece of black cowhide to represent the night sky and I was beating onto that hide. Um, now with the size of the, the hides that I selected this time, which were four feet by five feet, I put them in wooden racks, five by six feet. And I wanted to explore a different material other than, than beads and beadwork. Um, and I don't know if anybody's familiar with, um, with tufting. I think tufting is done with different kinds of hair, but up north we use moose and caribou hair. That's those are the most common hairs that we use. Um, so I was able to procure a lot of caribou hair and started to work with that material because it was the longest hair that I could find, which allowed me to make the biggest tufts that I could. I wanted because of the size of these suede hides I wanted the tufts to be as large as large as possible and to represent um, the main stars within these different constellations uh, and I was really I'm really happy with how they've turned out they've with the size of them they've really taken up um, a lot of the space of the galleries um, and there's this this constellation in these six beads on the floor of each of those galleries as well. It's kind of an anchor point um, and a way for people to experience and get a different perspective um, on this constellation, um, which I guess like leads me into the the story um, of Papuan Gijek of the hole in the sky. Um, so the story the story goes that star woman um, was up in the cosmos up in the sky world and one day she stumbled upon um, this this hole and looked down through it and saw a ski or land the earth down below and she wanted to go down there and so she asked grandmother spider if she could help her get down there um, and grandmother spider said yes but under three conditions um, the first is that when you go down there you must take on a physical form for the time that you're down there um, the second is that when you are done with your time down there you have to leave the physical form and everything that you've learned while down there third was you must leave a gift so the gift that she left was the, um, the original star blanket design that we have um, the original one had seven points it, it varies some have eight points now but the original seven point design um, comes from star woman That, what that story makes me think about is um, the time that we have on this earth and how precious it, precious it is um, that we do leave in, in, our, in our belief system, in our pre-belief system. We, we leave everything behind when we go back to the other side camp or the sky world. Um, and I think about that story every time that I that I look up in the fall and the winter Pakwan Gishik isn't visible during the, the spring and the summer but um, I was at a gathering in Alberta in September indigenous astronomers from all over North America came to Kananaskis just outside Banff for a new moon it's called Teethees and Telescopes and, uh, what was It, it was 
was just starting to be visible again over the horizon at that time in September. Um, I remember looking at it through um, through a telescope at that event, and I started to get really excited for when I would be back in my studio and creating works around it. Um, for one of the exhibitions back in Victoria, that I'm hoping to add to over time. I want to continue this project. I feel like I just kind of scratched the surface with having this first year to work on it. Um, I feel like I want to work on it for a couple more years and travel to more places, talk to more people about their stories, um, and create more works. Because that's one thing that I think has, has drawn me to this project. The more that I learn about it, the more that I talk about it with other people and show it, and this happened in Victoria for both of the openings that I had, people were telling me not only about star stories from their cultures, but specifically about Pakwan uh, Gishik and how important it is to them for ceremony. Um, so I want to learn more. I want to ask more questions. I want to talk to more people. Um, because I think it's... What I, what I keep going back to is how many thousands of years did the night sky and the stars dominate our beliefs before electricity, before lights started to block all of that out. Um, so being able to come to places like here or the Beaver Hills Sky Preserve in northern Alberta, where I spent a lot of time this summer observing the sky, um, they're really special places to me. Um, I guess the last thing I want to talk about is the, the name, of the name of the piece and the two weeks that I was able to spend here, I hold dear to my heart, um, not only as, you know, somebody who's busy like, curating and filmmaking to have a, a period of time like that to work on a project. Um, yeah, it was really special. And as I was spending my days um, reading, writing, um, listening to different things, and then my evenings looking at the stars, I started to dream about them. Um, and now I'm thinking about yeah how how my dreams and my dream world have been influenced by by this project. Um, I was able to commission a um, two sound works from um, a friend of mine back home. One of them is 22 minutes long and it helps to kind of create an immersive environment for the one exhibition with four of these racks on all of the walls. Um, but he also created a smaller sound piece for a video work that I created um, for the exhibition that focused solely on Pakwan Gijek. And I took the audio from that video and it's on my phone and I want to end this by, by playing that audio piece. Um, the sound artist is Matthew Cardinal and the three voices that we're going to hear are, uh, the first one is Wilfred Buck, um, who's a Cree astronomer and educator from Manitoba. The second is John Bigstone, who's an elder from um, back home where I'm from, um, Bigstone Cree Nation, Wabasca, Alberta. And the third voice is uh, George Desjardins, who's from Frog Lake, but lives uh, in Enoch Cree Nation, just outside of Edmonton. <coughs> and I hope it's going to be loud enough. Now it's worth all the nation. All this information relating to Achagosak and stars are uh, pertinent. They're just as relevant now as they were a thousand years ago, and maybe even more so. Every culture understood about the sky. Every culture was connected to the sky. Prior to the invention of, uh, of uh, the electric lights, we lived under the sky 
So we had time to recognize the patterns in that sky. We had time to recognize the teachings that, that were shared with us. And we had time to contemplate our, our reality. And uh, this reality doesn't need us. But we need this reality. And uh, so we have to become aware, decolonize our minds, and to become aware of the knowledge that our, our people carry for generation upon generation. And it's evident in Kitchik music, that great sky, in the Chagasap, those stars. When we talk about the Chagasap, you know, the root word is Achak. Achak refers to energy, it refers to light, and it can be translated as spirit. And uh, these things are what we are. We are energy, we are light, we are spirit. These are connected to our dreams, of course. Our dreams are connected to spirit. There's a place up in the sky. We, uh, we connect these things when we go to sleep. We dream. Along it, along it. When we connect to that night sky and we dream, even if we don't remember those dreams, we still dream. And we're told we're bombarded with information when we dream. Our dreams have uh, so much information compacted into a second. It, it can expand time, it can contract time, our dreams. It can bend space, our dreams. It can send us on journeys, our dreams. It can teleport us. Our dreams can do all these things. So they're a very important part of who we are as human beings. So when we look at that sky, we're told that uh, we're looking through time. We're looking through reality. When we dream at night, we connect to a place called Bhag Wini that hole in the sky. And when we connect to that hole in the sky, we're bombarded with information of infinite possibility. That's what we're bombarded with. Infinite possibility of things that could happen. Sometimes in our waking lives, we are walking around somewhere, or we're doing something, and all of a sudden we say, hey, this happened before. Or hey, I've been here before. Hey, I've seen this before. Hey, I, mean, I know that person. Yeah, because you've dreamt about that. And there's a certain chain of events that happen to make that reality right before your eyes. As indigenous people, that's where uh, our ancestors came from. As human beings, we carry the genetic makeup from the stars. And we never die. The body dies, goes back to the mother from which it was born, but our soul leaves to its place of origin, to the portal, to the Pleiades. Our people, we see the uh, Pleiades as uh, the doorway. We travel through there after we meet the Creator and we, we choose our parents. We, you know, we're shown our life before we be put in our mother's womb and we choose our parents. No matter how short or how long your life is or how hard or how good it is, we choose it. There was Star Woman who first made that journey down here. And she brought many gifts to our people. Language, ceremony, ataka, the star blanket. The important thing is to remember that spirit, that atzak, that we all have, that all these plants and trees, insects and animals have, they're not just items, you know, we need to get back to respecting them for what they are. It was really important.
important for me to include the voices of those people in this project. They are who I learned all of this from. So it felt it felt right to be able to include their voices in today as well. So I'm sure I missed some stuff <laughs> because I, I didn't write any of this down. But um, yeah, I don't know what your what format you're up for. If you're up for questions or comments, or I'm always curious. People, other people I meet and talk to about this, have their own stories. Focus stars. But I'll leave it up to Bernard's discretion as to how we proceed. <laughs> well, thank you, for you know, thank you again for being back. Um, well, I, I think if there are, are there any questions for Eli, um, in terms of something. yeah, in terms so the project is so uh, focused and centered around language, um, which makes a lot of sense, um, and yet the night sky and the stars is such a visual experience. Can you say something about what you see as the relationship between uh, language and vision? It was, it was something I was um, really struggling with in the studio. Um, how could I represent or portray these stories and the language um, through the works I was trying to create? Um, one important part of that for me was to um, write out, and because I'm still learning the language, write out these stories and include as much as I could and work with the language speakers that, that I have relationships with to include as much of the language with and alongside each of the pieces. And in the future, I may do that um, with audio, I have headphones or QR codes. But for this first iteration, I did want it to be visual and something right next to. Um, because, yeah, for me as a language learner, um, it's as important for me to read the language and see it written out, how it looks and feels, as it is for me to hear it over and over and over again, for me to be able to get the pronunciation right. That's one way that I've been kind of navigating that as a, um, a language learner um, and how learning the language and learning these stories go hand in hand. It's, they, they feed into each other. It's, it's, it's very good. And I guess we'll also have some time afterwards too for one on one questions. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was going to say. Let's, let's, are, yeah. let's hear from Did, I'm not sure, but I think maybe you, you said that there was a syllable attached to each star. Did I get that right? No. No, this, the, our, our written system is called syllabics. Mm -hmm. And these are, these are syllabics on my, on my knuckles. Symbols? Yeah. Okay. Not all of them. It's a it's a very sophisticated and beautiful writing system. Sometimes it's written in a chart, kind of a rectangular chart. But the one that I was shown by Reuben Quinn is in a star blanket design. It goes off in eight directions, and each of those symbols gets flipped and inverted and mirrored depending where it falls. It, it's 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 pretty genius, and I was pretty mesmerized when he was first telling me mm -hmm. about it. Um, Ruben, is, Ruben is sick right now, so I wasn't able to go talk to him this summer and ask more about what sparked my interest and how we got the star, how we got the syllabics chart, or that star chart from the stars. Mm -hmm. So that is something that is on my list of what I want to continue to learn about with this project. Cool. Right, well, thanks again. I think that's going to continue the conversation up there with some beverages and snacks. <laughs> <laughs>